I'm Dora Johnson. Marcia Stonehill. Jalicia Ward. Ursley M. Robinson. LaJuana Chambers Lawson. Melanie Ox. As I said, um, in I guess in emails, I, I have listened to what's been said at board meetings and talked with alumni association members. And I, the questions that I have have to do with the continued fundraising, how much money has been raised, and what are you doing with that money, where you are now, what is your interest in continuing this when there is no formal agreement, and you know, where do you hope to go with this? And then we can talk about the money. It was the RBAHC board who decided to continue even after the letter of intent was disrupted, we could say. So again, this is Melanie Ox. I think part of the reason why we decided to to proceed on forward is because we've also received feedback from community members of King George to proceed on. Um, so it's not just not necessarily a board decision as it was also gaining feedback from community members and stakeholders that are here in King George that mm -hmm. still think it's a good idea for us to pursue on. Um, we even held a panel um, to discuss this and had that be open to all community members. We've invited board of supervisors, we invited alumni, we invited um, everyone to, it was a public, basically a public me meeting um, and to get an understanding of what was being um what would need to be addressed and to see. And the response that we received um, and we received from the alumni as well, from the alumni members and those that participated was that they would like to see our AHC move, move forward in some form of fashion. So we are just trying to make sure that we commit ourselves to that promise of moving forward um, and, and do our due diligence in making sure that um, we put forth the best effort and and putting something together for the community that has been that has been on the on the kicking pan, so to speak, or the you know kick down the, the can kick down, so to speak, for the past how many decades now? Over twenty decades? I mean, over two decades. So um, so we're just trying to do good with the community and and what's been what's been asked and what the feedback has been for us. Okay, when did you have this public meeting? Um, this would have been September 29th of 2021. And pardon me, I'm going by recollection here. And that was virtual, right? That was virtual as well as it was in person. So we gave people the option to attend virtually. Let me see if and I have this. Um, um, one correction on what you stated there. We primarily did that for the alumni rather than for the public because our goal was to keep it safe. And this is Marcia Stonehill speaking, Kathy. Uh, uh -huh. Our goal was to keep it safe for the alumni. And we knew if um, supervisors were there or if government officials were there or if um, a journalist was there, there would be, that would be intimidating. And so we mostly did that particular panel for uh, getting to revisit where alumni stood as far as the support of RBHC, even though they're not coming forward public at this time. Marcia, thank you for correcting me on that. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so your feeling is there are a number of alumni members who would like to see you proceed. It's not a feeling, it's a fact. All right, well, how many people are we talking it's about? It's definitely a fact. Uh, it, it's, kind of, it's a bunch because when they showed up at the meeting and me being one of those that went to Rappin School, uh, uh -huh. it, was, um, it was a bunch of them that showed up at that meeting. Um, um, when they had that, um, they showed up in person. You're talking about this meeting in September with the yes. RBAC? Yes, ma'am. 
Okay. Um, can anybody give me anything more definitive than a bunch? I mean, are we talking about a dozen, um, three or four, 20? I think as far, uh, Kathy, as far as what came to the meeting, the numbers were not large. I would say we were in the 20 to 30 range and mm -hmm. they were representing other extended family members and such as well. Uh, I want to speak up here at this stage and I want to bring this on the table because this is why this is one reason why things keep spinning. One thing is we keep relating on a superficial level and we have to stop doing that because this is 2022. So it's time to acknowledge the reality of what has happened in this county and the reason why there are hesitancies for people to come forward because of how they've been conditioned. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we have a tendency in this county, the word on the street is, is it wasn't that bad around here. Well, that's simply not true. It was, a, it was very bad. Um, the Ku Klux Klan activity was intense for people, Black people and people of color in this community. I've been given stories, and I have to say, since you know, Kathy, that I'm a mental health provider, nobody was meeting with me as a patient, so I'm not breaching confidentiality and disclosing this material. We did finally get a newspaper article about the lynching behind the courthouse, but there's a lot of other things. Kathy, did you know that people had to sit in their homes and have someone on guard to protect and look out for whether the Klan was going to show up at their house? Do you know the building that still stands where the Ku Klux Klan used to meet and these alumni, as they were children, had to watch people going in there with their hats and meeting? Did you know that there were cross burnings and they still had to go to school after they witnessed cross burnings? Did you know that the Ralph Bunch High School was broken into and that band instruments were destroyed and nothing was ever done about that? Did you know that buildings were burned down? Did you know that there is a rumor that on Indian Town Road, this is where bodies were dumped? Did you know that Klan members were in leadership positions in this county? And so it wasn't even safe for these people to go to the cops to get help if there were rapes or if there were other criminal acts formed against them, there was nothing that could be done. So this is what we're still healing from. This is not about revitalizing a building. This is about healing a community. This is about telling the truth. This is about it's 2022. And if we still cannot talk about these things, we have much more serious problems than we thought we had. I don't dispute anything that you just said. I just don't know what that has to do with you putting up a billboard that says, help the Ralph Bunch Alumni Association save our history. When the Ralph Bunch Alumni Association has said, it doesn't need help or it doesn't want help from a group that's not that they don't consider legitimate okay this is delicia ward so i'm just going to speak kathy on um, what you just said just kind of regarding the billboard so just to be um kind of direct on what the billboard states the billboard doesn't say how help, help the ralph bunch alumni um because we know that the ralph rbac is a separate entity from ralph bunch alumni so we have completely separated the two. So we made sure that the billboard states help save African-American history um, in King George. And we wanted to make sure that that's all that it had said because to piggyback off what Melanie said and what Marcia said, that's exactly what we're here to do. Uh, we are here to help heal a community from systemic racism. Um, by uniting them through art and humanity. And we are here to preserve Black history um, within this county and within King George County. And so uh, the sole purpose of the billboard was to let people know that that is what we stand for and that is what we are here to do. And we have separated ourselves and what we had said from um, the alumni, if that makes any sense. Well, I'm so, looking at a picture. I have not seen, I didn't see the billboard today or yesterday. Maybe it's changed. Mm -hmm. I'm at a picture that was posted on April 21st 
And in mm -hmm. orange lettering at the top, it says, help the Ralph Bunch High School alumni save African-American history in King George. Has alumni been taken off of the billboard? Yeah, the word alumni is not on the billboard. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The billboard reads, help preserve the Ralph Bunch High School save African-American history in King George. And then it's got the RBAHC, donate today, rbahc.org. Okay, right. so it did have a to begin with, but that's been removed. It was never posted. It was never posted with some right. Right. It was never posted. That was never. It was never put on there. Okay. All right, I guess, right. Uh, well, assuming that Claudette posted this on Facebook, so she must have seen the billboard or at least a, an earlier draft of it or something? There, she must have seen, I don't know how she would have seen an earlier draft, but there was mm -hmm. a, a draft at one point that said that, and then we realized because of the controversy that that would not be appropriate to say. So we changed we never to something that would be more appropriate, and that's all that's been public. What you have has never been public. Okay, that's good to know. So where that was obtained, we're not sure. Yeah. Say that again. That was Dora. Where that was obtained, we're not sure, but that was never published with alumni on the uh, quill board at all. Okay. Well then, um, well that that answers that question. Then I guess the other one is, oh, all right, help. So you're saying it says now, help the Ralph Bunch High School save American history in King George. And your website continues to talk about revitalizing the building, correct? So I see that in, in what you're, uh, about your group. I see that listed there. Kathy, yes, we are. I mean, when, when you look at each of us live in King George County, we're taxpayers in King George County. And so we want to see a proper preservation of the Ralph Bunch High School, and we're advocating in that regard. And um, that's the bottom line. This is a solution to what's been spinning in a vicious cycle for decades, as was spoken earlier. And when you have local citizens volunteering to stand up and raise $12 million, it would take 8.5 million to restore the building, another 1.5 to furnish it and help create a very interactive museum in honor of the alumni. And then another 1.5 million to support the operating budget for the first three years. Can you explain to us why there's not cooperation and partnership from the county and from, and from other organizations? We can tell you that other organizations would love to support this. But because of other resistance, it's creating a lot of confusion and people don't wanna be called racist. So we have to be able to have conversations about implicit bias. We have to be able to have conversations about the trauma. We have to be able to have conversations about what is real here. This is a solution. All the county has to do is partner with us to do it. Even though we previously had a letter of intent, we were not met with the gate open, if you know what I'm trying to say. We were still met with resistance. We were told initially that we had to come up with $10,000 a year to keep the building off the market. Then we were later told that we had to pay for when the county had to um, consult with an outside attorney, we were told that we had to cover those expenses. So the negotiations have been very interesting. We have we wanted to put a sign 
in front of the high school to promote awareness of what we were trying to do while we were in the letter of intent. The ordinances would not allow us to do that. When we took things before the elected officials, we were met again with resistance. Can we? It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense that a group of people that are local citizens that are volunteering their time and donating time, energy, and money and promoting this, this opportunity and are willing to do the work to raise the money that we're being met with this resistance. It makes no sense. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with any of that, but you asked, why is that? Why is the county? I mean, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it, Marcia, but you're married to the Board of Supervisors Chairman. I'm not. So I'm guessing you would have better insight into why things are happening the way they are. On that note, I think that there's a lot of small town politics and misunderstanding in that regard. And on this note, Kathy, please let me just say this. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. I know a couple of times when you've quoted me in the newspaper before, you've said just that, you know, the wife of uh, supervisor Jeff Stonehill. And to me, that feels very sexist. I just, I'm an individual, I'm, you know, pursuing community service for a social justice issue. And I don't know what that has to do with him. It, you know, it just, there's a lot of small town politics around here. And uh, it's this, this, part of the problem is that there's, you know, people have gone to high school together, people are related to each other, and everybody's afraid of some sort of retaliation if they speak their mind. Well, I don't care if this happened in King George or New York City. If the um, the spouse of uh, an in a, an elected official who's on the board, if if that person's spouse is leading an effort, no, there's there's no one anywhere who would not make that connection, who would not um, make that reference, whether it's small town America or. Uh, in big city America, you you can't ignore that. You just can't. I don't disagree that about the small town politics and that everybody in King George seems to have a relative somewhere else um, along the line. But uh, no, you you can't ignore the fact that the two of you are spouses and that one is the chairman of the board of supervisors and the other is leading this effort. I'm sorry. then it needs to be a public conversation because there's a lot of confusion around that. And that's the other thing. I think we have been trying to have public conversations. We have asked for repeated conversations to support what Melanie was saying. And, you know, to only to, for no follow through. And again, what is that? Only to promote what? There's no follow through. Well, I mean, I'm trying, again, I'm trying to understand both sides of what's going on here. And I know that last year, your letter of agreement expired and the county was not willing to renew that. So, did, I mean, you're saying the county, why isn't the county willing to work with us? Well, I mean, didn't you have a set amount of time to meet some financial benchmarks and that didn't happen? Didn't you sign that intent that you would do it in that time frame and then weren't able to commit to it? Uh, did you hear the things that I explained earlier about the negotiations about the $10,000 a year and paying for the attorney? And, and then we had the pand pandemic happen, right? So right, but did, it would have been impossible. That was right at the, we didn't even have the option agreement signed at that stage. We didn't have the legal and binding agreement signed. We were told by the county that they cannot even publicly say that they have any type of relationship with us until they have the legal and binding relationship through the option agreement. Correct. We were trying to get the option agreement signed. Yep, trying to get the option, and that took years. 
that yeah. by the time that the letter of intent was expired, that option agreement was still in the hands of the county for them to review. Who and was that so, talking? Uh, uh, that was me, Melanie, Melanie Ox. Right, I understand that. And I know that other groups have had the same issue. They're trying to raise money for a building that they don't own. And that's been a problem in the past as well. But I mean, you signed an agreement, a letter of intent saying you'd come up with $2 million in the first year, right? That is what was in the letter of intent. And then we, what we were told that we didn't get in writing, which is unfortunate. And that's the lesson learned on us to always get things in writing. We were told verbally that, um, that of course, we could not raise the funds on a letter of intent because it's not a legal and binding document, but basically don't worry about it. But then, you know, when that county administrator left, then we're left in a lurch. Um, so, you know, I don't think there was really any ill intentions on that person's part. But it just it just goes to show that when there's a turnover, it just goes to show the importance of getting absolutely everything in writing, everything. And, um, you know, we took that person's word for it. There was email exchanges and um, only to learn that the next group of people that followed didn't feel the same way. So it was interesting to listen to the supervisors communicate with the, the uh, attorney that the attorney at the time then when they decided to not just make a correction on the letter of intent so we could move forward with the final draft of the option agreement. It was interesting when that county attorney said that he could not give legal advice to the Board of Supervisors when they asked for clarification as to whether the letter of intent was a legal and binding agreement or not. This has been clearly very messy, but again, our motivation is uh, to do the right thing, to see to it that um, the Ralph Bunch High School exudes honoring African-American heritage and consequently the alumni and that the stories that have never been told absolutely get told. And, and when you're doing a project like this too, it's the reason why arts and the arts were brought to surround the humanities aspect was to be able to sustain a project like this. Well, I mean, I guess my question is going forward, how long will you continue to go forward if you don't get an agreement with the county? Is that the ultimate goal, again, to resume an agreement with the county? It would be great to have a public-private partnership where we can be excited together and let this be a community effort that many people can join together and be excited about and feel good about doing and accomplishing. Um, that's the goal, yes, to come together as a community with our county government system and make something beautiful and great happen in honor of African-American heritage. And then also for the rotating space, the, for the space that we've determined could be where there would be a, a rotating gallery where that can be uh, multiculturally sensitive so that we can have educational components about multiple cultures. We can be LGBTQ friendly. This can be such a dynamic place to bring so much life and vibrancy. We don't have a movie theater. It can be a place where we can have family films, where fun events can happen. But the whole time, people can come and go through the exhibits and learn more and more about uh, the African-American heritage here in specific to this county and also about other cultures. It's such a grand and beautiful opportunity. 
Well, then what do you do to convince the county to partner with you again? We keep trying to communicate. We, we, we wish they would communicate with us. It, it does require communication. I would like for you to hear a little bit more from LaJuan Chambers Lawson. She's been um, very humble. <laughs> LaJuan Chambers Lawson is, uh, has a business called Tacit Growth Strategies. She has been written about in Oprah Magazine, Forbes, Market Watch. And as part of our due diligence, we consulted with her to see if our goals were realistic. Uh, we felt like it was only appropriate to get an outside perspective and uh, to connect with someone with the uh, expertise that she has and the honor that she's been given. Luana, would you okay. be willing to say a little bit more, please? Yes, Marsha. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, uh, you know, Kathy, we, we talked, I want to say it was last year about the really, from my standpoint, the work that the Ralph Bunch Arts and Humanities Center is, um, it's ahead of its time. It's ahead of its time and it's not at the same time, right? Because this is what Dr. Ralph Bunch stood for. So the work that we see them doing as it relates to revitalizing, the, wanting to revitalize the high school, this is what Dr. Bunch, in my opinion, would have wanted uh, to see for this space, especially in a time where, you know, a lot of us, just like in King George, I remember living in Richmond, you know, and traveling through King George was always something that would just make you uh, really afraid, you know, as a black person, we just did not like traveling through King George, you know, it's just the, the, uh, it's a, there's a very obvious sort of lingering of things that have happened in the past that have not been reconciled. And so when you see an organization like the RBAHC, where in which you have Marsha Stonehill, who is, she's serious, okay, about making sure that she speaks with and for the board uh, and for the community. When you see that type of leadership, it's very, it reminds you that Black history is American history, you know, and there's a, we like to do things, Dr. Bunch talked about it. He said, I'd rather go and work internationally uh, on helping these countries, these nations, you know, shake themselves loose of colonization then I would, you know, go home and deal with Jim Crow. You know, even he said that. And, you know, and today we feel this. We still feel this. You know, when Marsha was telling me about the Klan's persons and all the things that are still happening in King George, you know, when we want to think about technology and innovation, it has its place. But it should not replace the very... Uh, palpable need for us to address what's happening right now every day. Folks are still living in fear. Our people are still living in fear. And you should not be living in fear. There's no way for us to have any type of economic justice or prosperity if we don't feel safe, you know, to speak on these things that we've experienced that we thought were long gone, but they're not done. We never reconciled. We never fixed this race problem that we've been having for centuries. We haven't fixed it. And when, you know, when I saw the RBHC put up that billboard, uh, it was, it's refreshing to see it, but I'm sure that not, you know, people probably still don't really address what's on the billboard, right? We're talking about preserving African-American history and it's not saying that we are uh, preferentially, you know, placing African-American history above all else. What we're saying is that African-American history has not been uh, prioritized, right? In all these years, we still haven't addressed that. And this is our opportunity. This is our chance to do that. And I, I see this arts and humanities revitalization. This is what we need in King George, because that's what we've needed everywhere else. In Richmond, that's what we've done, you know, here, even in, in Texas, you see that. We still, if you can take care of your African-American history, then you can take care of all of your history. You know, if you can tell that story and, and prioritize telling that story, you'll be surprised how many other cultures will, will come out, you know, and, and then you'll realize all these linkages. Oh, I didn't know we had this history here, you know. So I just, I feel like this is the right 
the, this is the right thing for us to do right now because we got so comfortable, you know, that we've forgotten that we have not addressed this very important thing, which is the preservation of African American history. And the right now, before we lose people, you know, we don't want to lose our elders. I mean, especially for King George, you got so many, uh, you know, Gulf War veterans. You got so many, you still got World War II veterans and, and Vietnam and Korea. You've got all sorts of uh, veterans there, African American veterans, I'm sure, that could tell some, some, some mighty stories uh, that we would want to see in a museum. We would want to hear that, that oral history. We want to hear it played. You know, even if it was in a digital archive, we want that access from the source before we lose it. We don't want to lose these people. You know, and I, I, I see some of the things that are being talked about for King George and for Ralph Bunch High School in particular, and it's very exciting. I mean, these are not bad ideas. It, it's just, are we addressing our race problem? And it just doesn't feel like that's what we're doing. And we have to prioritize addressing the race problem. And the, the one thing about African-American culture and history, the easiest way to get it out is through what we're music, storytelling, those are the ways that we can make ourselves feel not only safe, but remind us that we belong in this place. This is our home. And people are, we're visible. We have to get people visible. You know, get them visible and, and make sure that people understand and recognize the value and the, the significance of these peoples and their histories in this place right now you know, before we lose these people. That's the mistake that I think we made in Texas, especially in these rural areas out here in Texas. You make that mistake, you just think, you know, you think you have time. We have time to get right. this right. Uh -huh. Not all the time. Okay. Well, as I'm listening to you all talk and say what you want to accomplish, I guess Part of me would wonder, well, if you're not able to do it at Ralph Bunch High School and you want to raise $12 million or however much you feel like you can, why not do it somewhere else? Find a, build a building, um, buy a piece of land and, and do it because what you're talking about goes well beyond that one particular school. Uh, we have publicly stated several times that the whole point of RBAHC is for proper revitalization of the Ralph Bunch High School because of the meaning of that high school. That was our first African-American uh, high school, right? In King George County. Correct. Later, right. later integrated in the 60s. I mean, so what better place to preserve African-American history? Right. But somebody mentioned earlier about how long this can has been kicked down the road. I guess how long are you going to let the new can get kicked out of the road and still nothing happen? Uh, Kathy, I think we hope that you'll write a story that creates some um, action. You know, uh, you, you have a lot of power, Kathy, in the way you write this story. And we hope that you're going to uh, paint this picture in a way that motivates people to have the conversations that they previ previously have been resisting having with us. You know, there's, there's no reason for this to not happen. So I think we're going to... We're here. We live here. We're not going anywhere. We all already work full time. We're we're in a we're in a groove here. We've got you know we're going. We're not stopping until something proper is done with that school. The alumni have been trying to make that happen, to my knowledge, to our knowledge, since at least 1998. Why in the world are we still having this conversation? This should have been done decades ago. But this speaks to exactly what we're talking about. There's the systemic racism that Jalicio spoke of. The, you know, what do people don't even understand what that means? The majority of people don't even understand what that means. You know, but why why wasn't this done years ago? 
it's, you know, again, but so yeah, we will, we'll just persist until the right thing happens. Okay. Well, on that note, then, um, I am assuming that you continue to do active fundraising. People can donate anytime they like. And how much money has been raised and what are you doing with it? We, Melanie maybe can speak to that. We have some accounts through Edward Jones and uh, Melanie, would you mind speaking into that? You're on mute, Melanie. Thank you. I don't have the other bank information because that's the, um, the treasurer is um, Bora and she has that information, not I. Um, with what is here, with what is here, we have um, the approximate value for today, $6,102.94. Okay, six thousand one hundred and two. Um, what did, weren't you almost at ten thousand? Well, that's what I'm saying. We have we. There's multiple accounts. I don't have access to the other accounts because I'm not the treasurer. Okay. Well, can somebody tell me then? Because you had almost ten thousand a year ago, right? When the LOI expired. Uh, Marsha, you're on mute. Hi, Kathy. Yes, this is Marsha. We have approximately 12,000 total. Any expenditures okay. right now are going toward marketing or, and or a documentary that we are creating. <clears throat> the documentary is focusing on everything we've talked about today. When do you hope to have when do we hope to have the documentary? The documentary ultimately is a budget of about $50,000. So we are gonna be fundraising for that. Next steps we also would like to take is we are ready to hire an executive director. We've talked with Luana Chambers Lawson about the process of seeing if we can get an executive director to start out on a volunteer basis, eventually to become a full-time paid position. But those are our first two priorities. And um, the documentary is going to be a process of a couple of years because ultimately the documentary is looking at what's been going on since 1998. <laughs> it's looking at um, the much bigger picture of the whole county and the history, uh, African-American history in the whole county, looking at Mount Bethel, looking at that we're going to move the Confederate monument, you know, looking at what uh, the American Legion Post 329 you know, looking at many different aspects, pulling all these uh, pieces together and uh, really creating the story like Luana Chambers Lawson was talking about, you know, before we lose these opportunities. And uh, so this is a process that will actually take a couple of years to pull the documentary fully together because that's just how documentaries work. But we definitely have it started. We have footage. We've got recordings that we're excited to be able to put out. And we're very excited about the talent that's doing this. All right. Well, I think that we have covered all the questions I had, unless there's anything anybody else wants to mention. We welcome any conversations. Uh, any questions, any concerns, um, we're very transparent. And the best way for folks to reach you is through the email? Through the email, and we do have a phone line, and that's also available at our website. We have the website, rbahc.org. Ursula, mm -hmm. okay. you're getting ready to say something? Yes. And Kathy, we want you to know that we have a lot of passion for RBHEC for doing what we do. So since we are godly people, and this is something that's been put on our hearts to do, we do plan on continuing to move forward with this and on a positive vibe from everybody as a team. We hope that you would make positive notes on what we're saying and take a serious. 
Um, I, again, I went to rapper school, so as citizens of this, it's not telling us to go somewhere else. It's we continue to stick with Ralph Bunch Arts and Humanity for the best. This will bring a healing. So much is going on with King George. And we want to bring unity and love to show what we're doing. So we will continue um, for positiveness from you and the King George County and everyone towards Ralph Bunch Arts and Humanity Center that we are doing everything we can. We might not make the first one, but we continue to do another letter and go forward in prayer that everybody will uh, work with us. Um, again, when it when previously, there was a pandemic. There was obstacles. Just like you all said for everyone else with the pandemic and obstacles, Ralph Bunch is trying, we're also Humanity Center is trying to move forward. We had some obstacles, but we will continue on positive vibes to try to bring um, uh, more forward. And um, that's about what I want to say. Okay. And I okay, think right? and then guys, what uh, Ursley just said, it is about team, leadership team. We are a leadership team. Yeah. And I would like to, this is Jalicia Ward. I'm going to piggyback off Ursley and what everyone has said. Um, and to conclude, so first and foremost, Kathy, thank you for taking the time to uh, talk with us today and to have this conversation, because as you can see, this is the conversation that is needed within all of our communities. And so as long as you know that RBHC will continue kicking this can because we are a safe space and we are building a safe space for the community to gather, to learn, to grow, to evolve to love and to respect one another. That is something that is absolutely needed in King George County. And what RBAC is also doing is we are giving a foundation for people whose voices have been silenced for many, many, many years. Ursley's is one of them. And she's on this call with us now. So as you can see, we are providing a safe space for people who are now courageous enough and no longer fear in speaking what's in their mind and their heart, no longer fear to heal, no longer feel to fear to move forward and to actually be acknowledged as a human being and an individual and someone important within our society and our economy. And that's what we have been doing since I have been a part of this organization. So the work that we're doing every single day, making a significant difference in black and African-American people's lives and our county is worth the time and energy invested into it. So we do pray that you put together what has been said, as difficult as these conversations are, and as sensitive as they are, if we don't face this, we will never move forward. And that's all I have to say. All right, well, thank you for that. All right, well, I appreciate everybody's time today. Thanks for doing this. And again, I'm sorry that the, um, that the technical things didn't work out on my end. I couldn't see you, but I can certainly hear you. So um, good luck with everything and keep me posted on anything happening going forward. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you all for right. taking time with the RBA HC team. No, no problem. You all take care. You too. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.